So should we briefly review what we did uh, in this uh, final part of the section? So we are looking at applications uh, or uses uh, of trees, particularly in computer science. And so, we look at the tree representation of expressions. How do you do a tree representation of an expression? First, you make sure that you know where are all the parentheses. If necessary, you put them there to make sure that you know. Then what do you do? You pick the operation that you do last. You put it at the root, and now, recursively, you do the same for the two operations, the left and the right argument. And you keep doing this one until you get it down to number and there is nothing to do. All right? This is the tree representation of an expression. Once you have this, uh, it's not difficult to write an interpreter. If the expression is a number, the value is the number. If the expression is an operation, you recursively evaluate the two arguments. And then you apply this operation of the two numbers that you have. You should uh, try to do this in your favorite programming language to make sure that uh, the difficult thing for a compiler at this point uh, is to put the parentheses where they are. So, once we have this tree representation, we can evaluate it or we can compile it, whatever it means compile at this abstract level. And so we learn about uh, traversals, pre-order, post-order, and in-order. And we say, if we do a post-order representation, post-order traversal, this is called a Polish notation of the expression, and if you have a stack machine, it's very easy to complete. Without recursion, very efficient. You push the things on the stack, and when you do an operation, you pick the things, uh, the arguments that are on the stack, and you replace it with the result. You can do it uh, with uh, operations uh, that take only one argument, write, uh, say, factorial, or uh, make a, a number negative, or they have more arguments. You can have a nift and else. They have the same three arguments, and they look at whatever and replace it with the result. And so in this way, you can compile. In order to do this, uh, we learn uh, about uh, traversals. What is a traversal? If you want, is a walk on the tree, where you walk around the tree, in such a way that uh, you list uh, all the decorations uh, that you find in the tree. And so, pre-order means uh, that uh, first you list uh, the route, uh, and then you traverse the two children. Post-order is that uh, first you traverse the two children, and then you list the route. And in order is that uh, first you traverse the left, then you list the root, and then you traverse the right. We saw that, for example, an application of this one is sorting. You build uh, a binary search tree, and then uh, you traverse it in order, and uh, you sort the values that you put in there. If the numbers are uh, scattered, meaning not already in order, then uh, doing this one is uh, quite efficient. It's a very good uh, sorting number. Of course, we don't know whether they are uh, scattered, scrambled, or perhaps uh, already in order. So we have to be careful.
So there is something interesting that you postpone. If you look at the chapter on trees uh, in your textbook, you find it there. This is called spanning tree. In this case, we have a graph. And in the graph, uh, the graph is like a tree, but instead of having a parent and the children, as nicely as you see here, you can have a parent that goes to a child, but then you have a child that goes to a parent, someone that groups around itself, so it can be quite messy. <coughs> so if you have something messy, you may want uh, to transform in or extract uh, a tree from that. And so first we have to learn about the graphs, then we do this one, and we see that you can do very interesting things with this one. Uh, example, when you go on uh, Google Maps and you find that the itinerary to go from one place to another, and it's telling you which street, the turn a left, the turn a right, how long you go, this is an application of this stuff. So now, I'm done with all this, uh, and I think it wouldn't be a good idea to start with graphs. Uh, so I would like to spend uh, the remaining half an hour answering your questions in preparation for the midterm. So if there is any subject or any problem that you feel that you are not a master in, this is a great opportunity to do problems, uh, to review the theory, anything you want. Yes? No, nothing about trees. I was hoping for a more interesting question. <laughs> Go on the slides and see on the textbook even. So, and sorry if something was ambiguous. It's never the intent to be ambiguous. Never. All right. So, let's see if we find a, a string. Eh? So, here it says that. that a string eh, is a finite sequence of characters with some special notation. And so, finite uh, typically is not necessary. Every time we talk about the sequence, uh, typically we think about finite. When it's not finite, we say that it is infinite. For sets, it's the opposite. Typically, when we talk about sets, uh, we think that they may be infinite. And it is fine, and sometimes you say this is a fine and set. It's just a convection. And so this is a sequence of characters. So we write it in any way we want. But there is this special notation. What is the idea? That the words that we use in English are sequence of characters, but the notation is the same. So, uh, so this is good that, that you are interested in this kind of precision. So, if we consider a programming language, we make a difference between this one and this one, right? In a language like C or Python, one is a character and the other is a string. In a language like C, the representation is very different. One is a byte. The other one is an array of bytes uh, 
where the last element of the array is a zero. And so, if you have to do operation with the string, you have the pointer to the beginning, because in C there is no difference between an array and a pointer. And to know where this ends, uh, you just uh, check uh, for this is zero, right? So there is a big difference uh, between uh, one character and one string uh, consisting only of one character. Now, because in the notation that we use for this one, we don't put a single quote or double quote. Eh? Now, when we discuss about this one, we get fuzzy. So this is an abuse of notation. Maybe it's also an abuse of student. And so we have to specify this one. Unless from the context it's clear whether we are talking about one or the other. So for example, we write the things like uh, this one. What does it mean that one? Say it again? Well, because we are talking about strings, right? Eh? Otherwise, it means what? The absolute value of it. And so, if I write that next one and there is no context, eh, you cannot tell me whether this is the absolute value, is the length of a string, eh, or is the cardinality of a set with A is a set. So, you have to hope that uh, if I give you a problem on this one, I'll be clear enough to give you the context that, that allow you to know whether it is one or the other. Typically in exam, when I am in doubt, I put it there very clearly. Sorry, I kept you waiting. Okay. I have a question. Once can I have a single one? Yes. Um, very Yes. All right. So first, uh, let's. Uh, homework four said there is a question six. Yes. This is exactly about that. Oh, you are not seeing it. So first, uh, let's uh, review the key concepts. We talk about sequences, right? In some cases, uh, we want a particular notation for sequences. The one that we use for words, or the one that we use for strings. All right? So, when we want uh, that notation, the elements of these uh, sequences, uh, we, call it, uh, we call them characters. There is nothing special about character, except, except that this is telling you, look, here, I'm going to use uh, that notation. All right? And so characters can be anything you want. You can consider uh, uh, really characters of an alphabet, whether it is the English or some alphabets that have uh, thousands of characters. doesn't make any difference. If you are, uh, if you study genetics, Typically, your alphabet is adenine, cytosine, and what are the components of a string of DNA. Interestingly enough, uh, we call it the string, the DNA. And so you represent the character typically with the letter A, C, G, and T. All right, so now we understand this. In this problem, in this problem, we say which of the following is not a language eh, over an alphabet A. All right? So a language is a string of characters, right? And so let's go one by one. Is, is a set of characters. Sorry. A language is a set of strings. Okay, so it's a set of sets. No, it's a set of sequences. Right. And so, is this a set of sequences? No. no. Is this a set of sequences? Yes. yes. Is this a set of sequences? Yes. Well, well, let's be careful because uh, there I'm telling you this is a, an alphabet, right? 
So an alphabet is a set of characters, not a set of strings. All right? So here, let's put a question mark. Is this a set of strings? Yes. So here, we are sure about what? The first one is not a, an alphabet. It's not a, a language. Because this is not a set of strings. Here. This is a string. Lambda. Yes. Yes, capital. Yeah. So it's not a... This, uh, we are certain that it is not uh, a language because it's not a set of strings, it's one string. These two, we have no doubt that they are set of strings. This one is the tricky one. We make the convention that uh, if you have an alphabet uh, and you denote with A, there is a language uh, that the strings, uh, each string is one character of A. And so, we look at this two. We look at these two as equal, where they are not equal. But why we consider them equal? Because we don't put the quotes. So if you take the quotes, they become equal, right? And so we make this confusion. This is an abuse of notation, and this is something frequent that we do. We do frequently like uh, the absolute value, the length of the string, or the cardinality of the set. Yeah. So in a sense, we have to get use of that. Mm -hmm. All right, so the purpose of all this was to stimulate this discussion. And mm -hmm. hopefully now, that don't keep. So the best answer in there is still A, because the... A, you are certain that that is not the length. So no the doubt. The best answer is that, right? Yes. Okay. And the other one, uh, we do that convention. This is the context in which uh, you do it. All right. So here, yeah, I don't want to be nasty. No, okay. I want to get you used to the way mathematicians write these things. Very good question. All right. Anything else? You ever said on that one? <laughs> oh, all right. Seven. Yes, thank you. All right, the seven. Here I have an alphabet. And I'm considering, I could also say that L is a length. Does it make any difference? This applies to both uh, as well. So I have an alphabet. And I consider those things with the star. So should we first remember what are these things with the star? Yes. One way to put it uh, is the set uh, of all the possible strings made of element of F, including the empty string. Including the empty string. So, if my L, let me write it here. If my L is a 0 and 1, where these are two characters, whatever it means that they are characters. <laughs> In L star, I find uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. All of them, including the empty one. All right? The definition of this one, by definition, this one is L to the 0, union L to the 1, union L to the 2nd, union L to the 3rd, the union dot dot dot. Should we say what are they? L to the 1, L to the 2, and that's all. This is the product. And so, L squared is uh, the language where you have uh, one element of L followed by another element of L. So this element of L are 0 and 1. So this L2 contains all these strings. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. What is L3? Three characters of L. So you have 0, 0, 0, or the possible combination until 1, 1, 1. Now, what is L1? Zero, 1, because we pick only one character. What is L0? 
lambda, the set uh, containing the string lambda. All right? So now we understand what is that L star. Yes? I think uh, some authors use one, some the other one, and sometimes I use both. Uh, okay. so it won't be both no, 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 is that? All right. So now, if we go back to this problem, here I say, is L star equal to L star L star, or the other one? So let's look at uh, B, answer B. <coughs> is this true or not? Yes. Yes, this is very obvious, right? Uh, because if you have a string, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, this is in L star. This is in L star. Then uh, you take the same string, uh, followed by lambda, and this is in L star, L star, right? And of course they are the same. So this one, in a sense, is obvious. Here you say, look, every string in L star is in L star product L star. Now, is it true also the other way around? Because you may suspect that here, you have all the possible strings in made of L. Can you get them more than all the possible strings made of L when you do this? Yeah. No, because this one is a, a piece which is in L star. A piece which is in L star, this is L star because it's just a string made of zero and ones, right? And so, this also is true. And is a little bit more informative. And so this is a better answer. More precise, more accurate, more general. And is the expected one. Also the other one is true. Yes, two questions. So, so back to what you did up above, L1 yeah. is 0 and 1 is then You're just taking all of the elements of L that are like 1? Yes. Okay. Yes? Well, technically by definition, Yes. Definition they have to be equal to Yes. And so because both B and C are true, A by necessity is the most correct. Right? Yeah. Well, it's also so suppose that I tell you this one. If I draw a picture, I could draw a picture this way. This is L star, L star. And this one is L star, right? So, do you have elements here? You don't know. If I write this one, you don't know whether you have elements there or not. You might or you might not. But if I write the other one, you know that there are no elements there. So, you know more. Yes. Good question. More questions. I see people are fascinated by strings. Yes? So this is six. Uh, yeah. so Which a problem? <laughs> All of them. Yes. Why not? Why not? Oops! You are not seeing it. All right. So what is an event? This is the definition. This is a subset. Done. So you flip a coin eight times. 
what is the probability of getting four heads and four tails? So the idea would be is half uh, because things balance, right? But actually, the number of uh, possibilities when you have the four and four is smaller than that. So first, uh, if you flip a coin eight times, how many possible outcomes you have? Two to the eight. Very good. And so now, how do we compute the one uh, uh, to have a four heads and four tails? Yeah. Is that four two six? Or sorry, four two No. So this is a yeah, many people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Someone else, uh, you have a talk less. It's combinations with repetition. Yeah, so you said combination, but probably you mean permutation, right? Uh, because the order matters, right? Yeah. So it's just going to be four heads and four tails. Yeah? The order matters because if you want, if you only count when there are four heads and four tails, there is only one. It doesn't say that. It says that. I'm sorry? Well, it, says, it says probably it came four and four. Not like four heads and four tails. Right. No, no, no. This means that. Uh, so, any, any, combination. any combination was the meaning here. So, for example, you can have uh, this uh, head, uh, head, uh, tail, tail, head, uh, head, and tail, tail would be a possible outcome, right? Yeah. All right. So, how do we compute uh, this one? Yes? 8 factorial over 4 factorial, 4 factorial. Exactly. This will be 8 factorial divided... Uh, 4 factorial and 4 factorial. How do we get uh, this one? First, we think they are all different. But then, uh, because we had the uh, 4 heads, uh, all the permutation of this uh, 4 are considered the same. And so, what is this number? Let me write it this way. 8, 7, 6, 5. Uh, and then I have a 4 factorial. Divided by 4 factorial and 4 factorial. So, these two cross... 4 factorial is what? Eh? 6 uh, times 4, right? So I cross uh, this 6 and I change uh, this into a 2. Yeah? So 2 times 5 is uh, 10 times uh, 70. And so what were the options here? And so here it says approximately 75 percent. Sorry, yes. <coughs> Sorry, so this one will be 70 out of 256. Yes. All right. Good enough? Next. So, you flip a coin eight a times. So what is the probability to have at least one head? Is the complement of never getting heads? Is the complement of never getting heads? Mm -hmm. So, how many? Yes. So. How many ways do you have to? How many ways you have to take? Uh, so basically, how many there are so that have no head? One, right? And so this is two hundred fifty-five divided by two hundred fifty-six. <laughs> Good. So you are very unlucky if you flip a coin eight times and you never get ahead, right? Sometimes you have to help yourself with uh, uh, common sense. All right. Number four. This is the expectation, right? So what is the probability? 
the probability is the summation of what? Yes. So the expected value is the summation of what? The probability of i for the value of i, where i goes from uh, 0 to 9. Right? What is the probability of i? 1 10. What is the probability of, a, uh, sorry, what is the value of vi? 7 take away 2i. Yes? So now we massage this a little bit, so it will be 1 10. Summation, i 0 to 9 of 7 minus uh, summation i 0 to 9 of uh, 2 multiplied in front. Yeah? Am I going too fast or not? All right, so what is this one from 0 to 9 of 7? So this will be 110, 70 minus what? This will be 9 times 10 divided by 2 multiplied by 2. Yes? Yeah? Thank you. And so this will be 70 minus uh, 90, which is negative 20, divided by 10, so negative 2. Now, this uh, really makes sense, right? To make uh, this game even, what would you like instead of this uh, 7? Say that again? Nine uh, or ten? Yeah, nine or ten. Because it'll flip at five. All right. Yes. Right. Good. All right. The next one? All right, so here it says all the string of length A over this alphabet, you pick one at random, what is the probability that there is a vowel? So how do you compute it? How many with a vowel divided by how many? Right? So how many strings that there are? 27. How many there are with a vowel? So, how many there are without a vowel? Two times two times two. Right. And so, you do the complement as usual, and you get the, the result. And so, you have 8 divided by 27, which is about one third, right? 8 times 3 is 24, instead of 27, you are almost there. Well, if there are no vowels for the first one, you can either choose B or C. You cannot choose A. Otherwise, there would be a vowel. And so for the next, and so for the next. Yes? Yes. Thank you. It's been a long day. Long way. Yes? So it's, you're saying that your language is now two characters and you have three spaces to write. Right. And so, the one that uh, there is uh, no vowel, the probability is dot 8 divided by 27. And so, the complement is uh, 2 All right. Yes, the time is up. If you have more questions that you want to say, I'm very happy. All right. Remember to bring the scantron for...